right, is that better? Can you hear me? Okay, coming out. Well, good morning. Welcome to all of you. What a joy it is to gather together on this Labor Day weekend and to remember that the work of our salvation, the hard work, has all been done for us. Jesus is the one who lived and died and rose again for us. We're starting a new sermon series this week, and it's going to carry us through the month of September, and we're looking at the pictures that God gives us of his church in the Bible. God describes the church in different ways. He talks about what the church should do, what the church should look like, how the church should operate. And today, we're going to talk about what the foundation of the church is. This is the fundamental truth that we need to fall back on. The church stands forever. But it doesn't stand based on you and me or on what we do. It stands based on what Christ has done for us. So may God bless your worship this morning as we talk about God's church and how it stands forever on those promises. I want to give a special welcome to all those who are joining us online this morning. What a privilege it is to gather together with you this morning. If you are tuning in online, we'd love it if you would leave a comment. Let us know that you're worshiping with us, even if the comment is just to say your name. Uh, it's good for us to see the people who gather together with us and to know how we can serve you best. If you're looking for our worship folder this morning, you can find that on our church website, livingshepherd.com. If you go to the Alive and Growing tab, you'll see a heading there for worship. Click on that and you'll find a button where you can download our worship folder. May God bless your worship this morning as we begin with our opening hymn, hymn 528, verses 1 and 3. Verses 1 and 3 of hymn 528. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life 
and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan in every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. We continue with verses 2 and 4 of hymn 528, Christ is our cornerstone. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love. Make us love what you command, that we may continue to be blessed by your promises. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Joshua, chapter 4, reading the first nine verses. Right before the, the people of Israel are about to enter into the promised land, God directs them to set up a monument. This monument, though, wasn't set up to remember their military might or their strength or their power as they went into the promised land to, to take their cities captive. It was a monument to what the Lord had already done for them. How he had rescued them from slavery in Egypt and how he was going to be the one that would continue to lead and guide and protect them always. In many ways, the church, the gathering of God's people is a monument to what God has done. He is the one who accomplished our salvation, and he is the one who grows and gathers these people together through the power of the Holy Spirit as he leads and guides his people to their heavenly home. Our first reading from Joshua 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future... When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. 
Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. This is the word of our Lord. Our psalm for the day is printed on you, for you on page 6. It's Psalm 34. We'll sing the refrain together everywhere that that's printed, and then we'll speak the verses of the psalm responsively. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. The Lord redeems his servants. and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Roman congregation, chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. When we know who we are as a church, this gathering of God's people, and when we understand all that God has done to bring us together and to continue to lead us and guide us and strengthen us, we can't help but respond just like the Apostle Paul does here. We give praise to God for his wisdom and his power. We give praise to God for his glory and all the wonderful work he does among us. To God alone be the glory. Our second reading from Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 529, verses 1 through 3. We'll sing hymn 529, Built on the Rock.
Out of respect for the words and works of Christ, please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for this Sunday and our sermon text this morning is from Matthew chapter 16, reading verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. So way back in the corner of our closet, uh, wrapped securely in heavy-duty packing tape several times, deliberately kept out of sight, hidden from view, is a box. It's an ordinary cardboard box. There's really nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing special about it. It doesn't contain some sort of secret treasure or, or stash of wealth. This isn't like an action movie where, you know, the hero has a box with IDs and passports and weapons in case he has to leave the country quickly. I don't have that. But if you found that box in my closet and you cracked it open, you'd discover that it contains all of my old high school yearbooks. And if you start paging through them and you find my pictures, you'd understand why that box is taped and wrapped and, and kept in the closet. There's something just especially uncomfortable, isn't there, about old high school pictures? It's this combination of a, a particularly awkward phase of life with, with the relentless passage of time. So that means that if you don't find your old high school pictures to be particularly embarrassing or awkward or uncomfortable, that means one of two things has happened. Either not enough time has passed and just wait, you're going to get there. Or so much time has passed that now people look at those pictures and say, oh, that's classic, that's retro, which is really just a nice way of saying you're old. That's what it comes down to. So here is my freshman year high school picture. I wish I would have found a way to blow it up on a poster for you. Uh, it's a noticeably scrawny kid with bleach blonde hair, freckles all over his face, and then big, thick, wire rim glasses. Tinted ones, too, the ones that had the tint that increased from the, the bottom to the top as he went up. His hair is spiked on top, probably a good two to three inches, and the sides are slicked back and combed, held in place with a pretty heavy layer of gel. And he's wearing a brightly colored, multi-patterned, thin silk shirt. No tie, but still buttoned at the top. It's honestly not a pretty picture, it really isn't. Um, but I guess the one thing you can say about it is, is that it's accurate, right? It, it captures who I was at that time. It, it's real. These next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the pictures that God uses in his word to describe the church. And some of the pictures that we see God using are, are going to be startlingly real for us, maybe even uncomfortable at times. And some of the other pictures he uses are going to be endlessly beautiful and comforting for us. But before we talk about either one of those, we have to talk about what the church is. Or maybe better yet, who the church is. Because just like my high school pictures are not pictures of an actual high school building, 
neither is the church that God pictures and describes in his word a building. And Jesus was once asked about this. The Pharisees once came up to him and, and they asked him when the kingdom of God was going to appear, when, when it was going to be established. And Jesus knew their hearts. He knew that they were looking for something tangible, some sort of physical thing that they could, they could point to, they could touch, they could hold on to, to say, yeah, th- here's the church. But he knew what was in their hearts and so he said this. The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is within you. So in other words, the church is people. It's people who have been gathered by the gospel. It's people in whose hearts God has given this gift of faith. Right? People that he has brought into his kingdom. And and if the church is people then that means that the church won't always be a pretty picture. Because people are sinners. We are sinners. And God spells that out clearly in his word. He calls us out on it. He says that even people who are already gathered in his church still struggle with a sinful nature, a sinful nature that cannot know or please God. A sinful nature that is actively opposed to God. A sinful nature that's deluded enough to think that it could earn on salvation all by itself. And that's why at times the church can still be an ugly place. Because the people that make up the church still sin. We still sin. We still struggle. And fight with with judgmental criticism and and stereotypes. We still misuse God's blessings and corrupt the gifts that he gives us. We we still try to hide our sin. And then we arrogantly pretend like we're fine. We're fine. And maybe we think we're even better than other people. But we're not fine. We are not fine at all. And this is where we begin to understand the true foundation of the church because the church is not built on sinful people. Even though sinful people make up the church, the church is built on the sinless Son of God. And Peter has a a beautiful way of confessing that, doesn't he? When Jesus talks to him and says, what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There's a a stark difference between my freshman year high school picture and my sophomore year high school picture. Those hideous tinted glasses are gone. They're replaced by contacts. The the spiked and gelled hair has been shaved off, uh, previewing, I suppose, the haircut that I'll probably have for the rest of my life to try and hide my hair loss. And that that multicolored, brightly patterned shirt is replaced with a plain, ordinary T-shirt. And I think there's something different about me when you look at that picture. It's not just what what I look at, but I, I think there's sort of this sense that even though I'm still awkward and uncomfortable, right, I'm starting to learn a little bit more about myself. And in a way, that's what happens with the church. The church recognizes and grows in this understanding of who they are. They're a gathering of sinners. And so then the church begins to just stand back in awe and appreciate all the more how God pours out his grace onto this this church, this gathering of sinners. So the church rejoices in in the daily announcement of forgiveness, the, the announcement of forgiveness that we have at the beginning of each and every one of our worship services. 
The church stands back and says, can it really be? Can it really be that God is not bored by our confession of sins? That, that God is not disgusted by our continual struggles with sin? Can it really be that every time we come before him, God reaches out to us and takes that sin off of our shoulders and declares us righteous for the sake of the one who took those sins to the cross? Can it really be? And the answer is yes. Yes. The church is built on the forgiveness of Christ. You are built on that rock. And the church rejoices too in how God continues to grow and gather this church. The, the fact that he uses sinful, awkward people like us is amazing. He continues to, to touch people's ears and to reach into their hearts through your words and actions. Maybe it's an invitation to a Bible class. Maybe it's, it's a quick prayer of thanks right before a meal. Maybe it's a hug to someone who's been diagnosed with cancer. Whatever it is, God takes it and he uses it as your confession to witness to what God does. And then, having been filled with all the forgiveness and all the peace and all the life that you could have in Jesus, you follow Peter's example and you tell other people exactly who this Savior is. He's not just a good teacher, not just some interesting guy. He's your Savior, the Son of the living God. Can it really be that God uses us, sinful, awkward people, to grow his church and to witness to his power and testify to it? Can it really be that our forgiveness is the tool that God uses to grow the church? Can it really be? You know the answer. Yes. Yes. The church is built on the forgiveness of Christ. You are built on that rock. And the church rejoices, too, in how God doesn't make his grace just a one-time occurrence. He continues to come to us and, and strengthen our faith. He, he comes to us in, in the cleansing waters of baptism, right? So the church rejoices any time another infant or, or another adult is brought to this baptismal font. And you rejoice when, when you think of the amazing gift that God gave you at your baptism, the forgiveness of sins and a new life grounded in Christ. The church rejoices when another couple gets to stand up, like they will today, and profess their faith in the triune God. And you rejoice right along with them as you stand beside them, as you receive Jesus' body and blood given for you. Can this really be? Can this be that each and every day God opens his word to you and promises to grow your faith? Can it be that, that God reaches into your heart and into your soul and into your mind and into your body and touches all of these things with his powerful grace? The forgiveness declared at the cross. Can it really be? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. The church is built on the forgiveness of Christ. You are built on that rock. And there, on that solid foundation, there is no need to fear failure or loss or defeat. Because, after all, as Jesus himself says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So there's, there's one more picture that I, I need you to see. It's my senior year high school picture. This one's a, a bit bigger if you look in the yearbooks. Uh, it's, it's more intimate in a way. It's a close-up. And maybe I, maybe I read into things a little bit too much, but as I look at those pictures, I think, well, there's a little bit more age and experience here, right? My faith, face has 
sort of a weathered look after enduring the battle of high school for the last three years, but there's also some sort of like subtle joy and anticipation, right? It's like the picture is saying, yeah, life's been hard, but it's just beginning. There's more good stuff to come. That's like the reality in which the church lives. Right now, there's a battle going on. And yes, that battle is going on in the individual lives and hearts of of each and every one of the sinners that make up the church. It's the daily battle against Satan's threats and temptations who would love nothing more than to recapture some of his prisoners. It's the daily battle against temptation to complacency and and laziness and, and fear and worry as the sinful nature tries to gain some ground by doubting God's love and care. It's, it's the daily battle to hold tight to all that God promises, even in the face of what seems like contradictory evidence all around us in this world. Right? The, the uncertainty, the, the division, the spiraling lack of love. Is God really on his throne? Because it doesn't look like it. But you know the answer. Yes, he is. His word still works. His church still stands. And there is even more to come. That battle is also played out in the collective work and ministry of this gathering of sinners, of God's church. Because God's church is not content to simply sit in their padded chairs in the sanctuary beneath these wonderful Christmas lights, right? The church goes out. The church storms the the heavy walls of Satan's fortress, releasing those and freeing those who have been captive to sin and death. The church swings that sharpened sword of God's word, declaring that the Savior from sin has come and has won eternal life. And, And through it all, the church trusts It trusts that success in ministry isn't determined by the balance of a bank account or even by the number of chairs that are filled in on a Sunday morning. No. Success in ministry is determined only by what God promises. And God promises that his church will endure. He promises that his word will work. And grow that church. Even if God doesn't promise that living shepherd will always be here in Laramie, Wyoming. But God also promises something more to come, doesn't he? He promises something better to come as he carries this church, this gathering of sinners, as he carries you to your heavenly home. That is the ultimate picture of the church, isn't it? The church in heaven, glorious, victorious, no longer threatened, no longer battling. That's a picture that God spends a lot of time and detail on in Revelation, but it's also hinted at here in these verses in Matthew when Jesus says, the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome his church. Because it stands forever on the rock of Christ's forgiveness. You stand forever on that rock. Amen. Please stand. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior, be the glory and the majesty and the power and the authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to confess our Christian faith this morning by singing hymn 403, I Know My Faith is Founded. It's printed for you on pages 8 and 9 in your worship folder.
At this time, we will gather our thank offering. We're not able to pass an offering plate right now, but there is an offering plate on the little table in the back, and you're welcome to drop an offering in there anytime you feel so moved. If you're a guest or a visitor with us, joining us in person this morning or joining us online, please know that you are not obligated in any way to give. We are simply happy to have you here and to share the word of God with you. This is one of the ways that our church works together. This gathering of sinners works together to share the good news of Jesus in our community and in our world. During this quiet time of reflection for the offering, especially those who are joining us online, we invite you to stay connected with us as a congregation. Make sure you like us on Facebook and follow our page so you can receive regular updates about our ministry. If you're interested in learning more about our church, you can sign up for weekly and daily devotional emails on our church website, livingshepherd.com. At this time, we have the special privilege of welcoming some new members here at Living Shepherd, so I'd invite Christopher and Amanda to come forward. Dear members of Living Shepherd Evangelical Lutheran Church, Christopher and Amanda, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desire to become members of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death, If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Living Shepherd Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our worship now continues with the prayers that are printed for you on pages 10 and 11. Please stand. 
at the place for special prayers today will include a number of our brothers and sisters in Christ. First of all, we'll pray for Amanda and Christopher, thanking God for them and asking God to continue to bless and strengthen their faith. Uh, we'll also ask God to comfort and bless our member Sam, who will be having heart surgery October 8th. Uh, he has been going through a number of appointments, and so hopefully now with a, a surgery date in mind, we'll ask the Lord to give him peace and comfort. Um, we'll also ask the Lord to bless another one of our members, Johnny, who has been undergoing a number of tests this last week. Um, the doctors suspect that it might be cancer. Uh, we'll hold her up into the Lord's hands as we pray. We pray. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Lord of the church, you are the one who gathers your people and brings them together to hear your word and carry out your ministry. Bless Christopher and Amanda as they join your church here at Living Shepherd. Continue to grow and strengthen their faith daily through your word so that they appreciate your love and mercy all the more. Make them faithful, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit so that they eagerly stay connected to you and they gladly serve you with joy in all the ways that you provide for them. And use us as a congregation to support and encourage them that we all may remain members of your church until you call us to our heavenly home. Almighty God, we ask you to bless and comfort Sam as he prepares for heart surgery on October 8th. Comfort him with your reassuring presence and your promise to always do what is best for him. As the day of surgery draws near, give him peace of mind and rest. And bless all those who care for him. If it's your will, allow the surgery to be successful and Sam to return to health, praising you in all that he does. Use us to encourage him and his family and to point them to the eternal promises we have in Jesus. And dear Lord, in your wisdom, you sometimes allow trouble and difficulty in our lives to draw us closer to you and to help us trust you more. Today, we ask you especially to bless Johnny, who is undergoing tests for what the doctors suspect is cancer. Strengthen her body to not only fight the illness, but strengthen her soul as well, so that she knows your promises to be with her and use this trouble for her good. Give her a strong and lasting faith that trusts your love no matter what the circumstances. If it is your will, allow the work of the faithful doctors and nurses to help her and restore her to health. Above all, though, help Johnny and all of us to keep our eyes focused on the cross and the forgiveness that is ours in Christ. Gracious Lord, thank you for all the blessings you pour into our lives, especially this weekend. We thank you for the blessings we sometimes take for granted, work and rest. What a gift it is, Lord, to serve you and proclaim your glory in our jobs and vocations. And what a blessing to have time to rest and reflect on these gifts. Make us faithful workers for you and keep all those who travel and celebrate this weekend safe in your care. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Amen. 
We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Our worship continues now with the preparation for Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. In his word, God tells us that when we receive Lord's Supper, we are receiving bread and wine as well as the body and blood of our Savior Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. God also tells us in his word that when we stand up and commune together, we are in fact confessing agreement of faith and teaching with those with whom we commune. For this reason, we kindly ask that if you are, are not a member of our congregation or a congregation in fellowship with our church, that you kindly refrain from taking Lord's Supper at this time. This will give us the opportunity to study God's word together, to learn more about what he says about this wonderful sacrament, and it will also help you to not be in the uncomfortable position of confessing your agreement with us without first knowing what we teach. 
You're invited to come forward now for Lord's Supper. We will do continuous distribution again. So what that means is we will form one line in the middle and come forward. You're welcome to take the bread and the wine. Uh, you can come together as a family, but please do not feel like you need to stay up here at the table until all of the words are spoken. I will be repeating those words continually, so you'll be able to hear them as you return to your seat as well. Come, for all things are now ready. Receive with believing hearts, then, the blessing of our Lord. This true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will strengthen and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Our service continues with the closing prayer. It's printed for you on page 13. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is printed for you on the following page. It's hymn 382, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. <laughs>